Welcome, welcome everyone. Get a few minutes to get everyone on here. If you see in the side in the chat, there is a two and a drop down. So make sure that if you want to talk to the panelists or all the attendees and the panelists, you click the right drop down. Looks like we're filling up here, getting some attendees. Where's everybody at in the attendees? Where are you from? Let's get the chat going. Remember, we have a little box in the Q&A over there to ask anyone on our panel some questions. Um, Dr. Hunt will only be with us for a little bit today, so make sure you get any questions to him in the chat right away. Hello from the UK, Maria, and Robert from Canada. Alan from Arkansas, all over the world. Hillary oh, in yeah. Buckingham. Hello, Hillary. Uh, I recognize that name. <coughs> we are, are excited to bring you this opportunity tonight, and we're going to get rolling in just one minute here. Sweden, look at that. All wow. over the place. Awesome. Sweden, Wisconsin, Britain. Another Stockholm here. I am just working on getting Inga brought in and we will get started. There she is. Hello, Inga. Uh, Inga's gone through all the effort of putting a backdrop. <laughs> I'm at a friend's house. <laughs> and, uh, so I got to choose. And so there was the burning zombies uh, backdrop. Uh, and then there was, what, what are my other choices? Oh, all go. right. Well, let's get going here, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have the pleasure of speaking with several panelists tonight. Um, and my co-host is the amazing Linda Blade. Um, for those who don't know me, I am the founder of Save Women's Sports, <coughs> Beth Stelzer, amateur power lifter, and I am really excited for this opportunity. Linda, why don't you give us a brief little intro here? Well, I guess most people know me as Coach Blade, and I am a coach. I'm also president of Athletics Alberta, a track and field association here in the province of Alberta in Canada. And a long time ago, I was an athlete back in the 80s. I was Canadian champion at one point in the heptathlon. So I have a long time uh, experience in sport. And for obvious reasons, that's why I'm involved in this issue. Plus, I have a PhD in, in human biology. So kind of adds to it. And a warrior on Twitter, I must say. It's an <laughs> honor to have you tonight. The, the annoying lady who Twitters. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to begin with some facts and science. And to start us off, we have the honor of having Dr. Christopher Hunt's time. He is the medical director for USA Powerlifting, and he is, front, he is on the front lines fighting on COVID right now. He is uh, in his scrubs, you can see. Uh, yep. Yeah. Hi Chris, guys. take it away. Yeah, so I'm actually uh, physically in a hospital right now, so if you hear some beeps and whirs, I'm in a back room in the hospital, so I've got to slap my mask on and go to work. Um, after I get off the call here, but I just wanted to um, thank Beth for get, giving me the opportunity to talk about data and science, because I think really this matter um, does boil down to, to data. Um, and that's kind of where it's, I think, going to be one. Um, not only that, I think the stories, the stories of the athletes themselves and kind of the impact of the female athletes themselves in particular, but um, at the end of the day, I think that <clears throat> the thing that really is going to matter is that we have, have data. Um, and so <clears throat> kind of toward that end, you know, I am the medical director for USA Powerlifting. So what's powerlifting? So for those that don't know, powerlifting is a, a very simple sport. Um, so it's three lifts. It's the squat, the bench, and the deadlift. So you're literally moving a barbell in straight lines against gravity, and that's about it. Um, and it's a display of 
pure strength, essentially. It's actually arguably one of the, the best displays of, of pure strength because they're complex multi-joint movements um, that you're moving against gravity. Um, I would say it's slightly in contrast to Olympic lifting or weightlifting, where there's some more skill involved, some more explosive power. Powerlifting itself um, is actually a misnomer because there's actually less power than weightlifting. And it's literally just a demonstration of your static strength. So your ability to move a weight slowly and just complete a task. And so kind of toward that end, um, the transgender situation um, becomes kind of an interesting one because we have a very objective sport and I've actually made, I've made this statement before in meetings and um, presentations and stuff that, you know, if powerlifting loses this argument or loses this situation, then everybody loses, right? Um, because we have um, arguably probably the biggest spread between male and female um, capabilities in our sport because there's less skill involved. So like I said, it's a pure demonstration of actual strength. Um, and so there's the skill requirement is, is essentially probably on the, on the lower end of more, most sporting endeavors. Say like, you know, there's powerlifting where it's just kind of like high work, low skill sport. And then there's archery where there's high skill uh, kind of low effort sport, if you want to think about it as like a, a continuum like that. And so the gaps between male and female performance are typically smaller when there's a higher degree of skill involved um, because skill is, is acquired over time. Um, and when there's high, high work capacity, high strength in particular as a domain of sport, um, then, the, then the gaps between male and female kind of show a, a greater breadth. And so toward that end, um, Beth, if you want to put up the first um, infographic that I've got for everybody, um, there's a group from the UK um, that called Gendered Intelligence that has, oh, here we go. Yep. Um, they're taught, and they talk about trans athlete inclusion in kind of this way of well, the gap between male and female performance is small, and they show two bell curves. Um, and they say, well, look at all this overlap, and why, um, why can't inclusion be a thing? Because there's this high, high degree of, of overlap in the middle. Um, and and the, the axes here are a little kind of funny. They're pretty much non-scientific, but... Um, a bell curve essentially just demonstrates, you know, what the full breadth of a pop any given population would be, right? Um, if you remember from any basic statistics class. Um, and so on the left would be the female bell curve and on the right would be the male bell curve. Um, and then in, in that kind of middle portion, there's so much overlay. The argument is that, well, <clears throat> because there's overlay that it really doesn't matter because most people are about the same between male and female. Well, in our sport, that's very much not the case. And I'll get to that in a second. But also that argument demonstrates kind of a basic misunderstanding of fundamental statistics. Um, because if you have even two bell curves that are kind of close like this, there's a lot of statistical tests that exist to see are these two groups different or not. You know, could you take a sample from, from this group and demonstrate that that's from group A versus group B randomly? You know, that's why statistics themselves exist, right? And so <clears throat> even with these two bell curves, even visual inspection, most of, most of the time, if you have two bell curves that look like this, you'll be able to demonstrate that the two groups are in fact different. And then Beth, if you want to go to actually the second uh, figure, um, You'll see in a second here that for USA powerlifting, those two, two groups are much different. And so you can kind of look behind the yellow, if you imagine behind the yellow, where the overlap would be. This is actually the, the data that we have from our International Powerlifting Federation, not just USA powerlifting, but the overlap in the middle is actually very small. Um, and the two groups are very different. And so, <clears throat> You actually, we figured this out. How different are they? Well, males, um, 
between their total, their uh, compared to females, so among their total of squat, bench, and deadlift, compared to females, um, the, the difference is about 180% or so. So males, on average, outperform females 180%. So would that be fair for a male to compete against a female? Pro probably not, right? Um, so hence the reason the two groups are segregated, they're different, and, that, and why we base our uh, classes on sex and on weight class, but predominantly the first thing is on sex, right? Um, because in, interestingly, we, in, we analyze the data and sex is such a strong predictor of your powerlifting total um, that it's actually the most important variable of any of one that we looked at. So it's not weight class itself. It, seriously, it's not even weight class. Um, it's not age. It's sex. Sex is the biggest variable that accounts for the greatest difference between the two groups in powerlifting. Um, and again, you look and the overlap between the two groups is so small. Um, I mean, you have the highest performers on this, the first bell curve on the left, the yellow bell curve, the highest performers only begin to approach, if you kind of scroll, go kind of use your mouse, then kind of go down toward the right um, the highest performers over here um, only start to approach kind of the, the average performers in the male international group that we looked at. And so bottom line, what does this mean? Well, this means that the two groups should remain separated. So then the question always comes up of, well, then what if somebody transitions from male to female? And there's some studies that looked at that um, and the average muscle loss um, if somebody transitions to become trans female, so male to female trans, the average loss of muscle mass is about 10%. The average loss of strength is about 10%. And so if you have um, males in our sport, which is a pure strength sport, performing at 180% of the females, and they only lose 10%, We'll even say, give them 20%, they're still operating at 160-ish percent of uh, the females. So again, it kind of begs the question, well, where's, where's the fairness here, right? Um, and, and that's kind of the argument that we, or the contention that we made, I don't want to turn this into an argument, but the, the reason that we um, are not allowing um, the reason that we are not allowing male to female trans compete in the female category is because we felt it would be a patent unfairness. Um, and then there's kind of like a bunch of other kind of lesser arguments that come up. Um, I, I can go into those in depth as well, but I'm, I, like I said, I get pretty verbose and I'm already well over my 10 minutes, but um, you know, an argument that comes up is um, the social conditions hypothesis, you know, so why, um, why, or, or sorry, so females in sport do not have the same opportunities from a young age as males, and therefore they don't acquire skill sets um, early on as males, and therefore don't um, progress in sport like males do. And there was a study that looked at swimmers, um, American swimmers, with regard to this, and actually females are, um, females are afforded actually more opportunities than males in the U.S. Um, in the sport of swimming from a younger age. Um, and as it turns out, once males hit puberty, they start to outperform the, the females, and then that gap definitely widens by the end of high school age, essentially. So 18, and then 19, 20, the gap just continues to progress. Um, and so then that, that kind of speaks to the effect of testosterone and the Y chromosome. Um, the, the, the thing that I'll just kind of wrap up with is this, since this is, a, this is supposed to be about the Olympics, and um, I'll kind of get a little bit into the Olympic ruling of the trans, the current trans rules as they stand from 2015. And there's kind of this hyper fixation on testosterone alone and getting your testosterone to below a certain level. And while testosterone is definitely an indicator of performance, um, I would say that 
it's not the whole picture and the, ex the explanation. And Colin's going to talk about this too, of the univariate fallacy. So you're using testosterone as kind of one variable to explain the difference between male and female. And there's a lot of things that go into the, the difference between male and female, in particular with performance, um, setting aside skill. So there's testosterone, but there's also the Y chromosome and the response to testosterone. And so the response to testosterone is, is due to pretty much two factors, the SRY gene, which um, causes males to have um, eventually male secondary sex characteristics, um, and then androgen receptors. And so there's a condition known as androgen insensitivity syndrome, and there's androgen complete insensitivity syndrome and androgen incomplete sensitivity syndrome. And a person that has androgen complete insensitivity syndrome won't respond to testosterone at all. And so therefore, um, it's kind of not like a, a relevant intersex condition to talk about. Um, and without kind of going too far into the intersex question, um, we, I think we've pro we're probably all familiar with the castor Semenya case. Um, the, the bigger is androgen incomplete sensitivity syndrome, because if a doesn't respond to androgen at all, then they're actually going to be essentially female and just happen to have a Y chromosome. But if they have an ink response to testosterone, well, then they'll, they'll respond to it to some degree, have a Y chromosome, that really matters for performance. The biggest issue with interest at hand, I think it's to be, when we talk about these discussions of trans and intersex and what do we do, we really need to, we need to separate the two as far as dis discussion points. So intersex really needs to be governed by a set of rules. And in particular, the one that matters the, the most for, for, for performance of any intersex condition is androgen incomplete insensitivity syndrome, far and above any other intersex condition. And then separate those rules from trans rules governing you know, male to female, trans women in particular. Um, those, those rules really need to be separate in our minds um, because then we get into conversations of the, like, how do you check if somebody's female and an invasiveness of checking people's genitals. And then that becomes kind of a quandary as far as rule setting. Um, but anyway, so like I said, I'm, I'm way over my time here. Um, but I wanted to just make sure that you guys are aware that as far as strength sports in particular, I think we have a strong argument as far as this is why we have our rules the way we do. And I think a lot of other sports can platform off from there. Most definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Hunt, for your time today. That was awesome. And um, do you have any time for some questions here? Or do you need yeah, to absolutely. dip out back to the run? No, we're good. We're good. Um, somebody's wondering if the DSD intersex standards for testosterone are the same for trans athletes. They've kind of lumped them together. Um, and I would argue issue. inappropriately so. I mean, I, the intersex question is actually a, a more difficult one, I would, I would argue, because it doesn't involve transition from one sex to another, right? It, it's literally the person was born that way, and then what do you do with this quandary? Um, the Castor Semenya case, oof, that one, I mean, like I said, I, I wouldn't have wanted to be on that, that panel, um, but... Can you clarify us what um, Castor Semenya has? So my understanding is that she does have 46 XY androgen insensitivity syndrome. So now somebody may correct me, but that is my understanding of the matter. And so she really has the intersex condition that matters the most for sporting performance when that type of person identifies as female. Um, because the problem is that a lot of things get in lumped into intersex that could arguably not be included in intersex. So, so PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, gets lumped into intersex, right? Polycystic ovarian syndrome, the vast majority of people with PCOS identify as female. They just happen to have a slightly elevated testosterone level and a few other issues that go along with it. Now that said, um, podium finishers at the Olympics actually have PCOS 
itself as, as a syndrome has a larger representation of podium finishers at the Olympic level because it represents women with higher testosterone levels. But I also think there's a stronger argument to be made that PCOS probably shouldn't even be considered an intersex condition at all. Um, but anyway, so um, the bottom line is, so yes, there is a testosterone level to answer that question. Um, and they set it at five because then it includes a cutoff for folks with PCOS. Um, but a five nanomol cutoff is really substantially high um, if, you can, if you include um, all women in aggregate. Exactly. Thank you for clarifying that for everyone. I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Um, anything else you'd like to add while we have you? No, I think, um, I think that it's great that you're doing this, Beth. I mean, I think that it's awesome that a bunch of women... Oh, here we go. Do we have a simple DNA test? Yeah, this is a good one. So, Thank Castro, you. these are good questions. Okay. Um, so, Castor is intersex, and my understanding is she has a Y chromosome with partial response to testosterone. And I think that's the best way I can answer that. And she identifies as female. Like I said, the Castor case is very tricky, <laughs> especially for, with regard to rulemaking. Um, uh, and I'll leave it at that. And then, yes. So I, my understanding is that Castor has a Y chromosome, yes. <clears throat> and then, and in, in internal organs that contribute to the increased testosterone levels. Correct. Well, with a partial response to testosterone as well. And then I think there was a question about, can we do simple... Um, yeah, DNA tests. Yeah, so that used to actually be done um, in the Olympic level because there were actually... This is a conversation that's actually not new. This has been going... This is a conversation at the Olympic level that's been going on for decades. Um, in fact... Um, oh, there you go. It looks like Emma Helton corrected me, and it seems like Castor may have a full response to testosterone. Um, thank you, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Emma, for the clarification there. So, but this conversation um, essentially goes way back, even to the '60s and to Eastern, like Eastern Bloc considerations, because apparently, their Eastern Germany was trying to get males in on female performance and kind of sneak them in, and then. So then the Olympics kind of went to um, literally like checking genitals, like emanations. Uh, that, that was felt to be kind of barbaric. And so then the Olympics went to buckle swabs, so swabbing somebody inside their cheek for chromosomes. And then that was also felt to be too invasive. And it was also felt to be like a little bit too difficult to do because it's kind of cost prohibitive. Um, it's actually quite expensive to do the buckle swabbing, chromosome testing. Um, but anyway, so that, but these are things that have been done historically. Um, do they need to be brought back for the Olympics? Maybe. Um, are they practical for like the high school level? I don't know. Um, that's a difficult one. Um, and then that, I think that that, but that is also why I suggest that we keep conversations about trans rules and intersex conditions separate because I do think they need to be governed under separate um, guidelines. Sharon, did you want to add anything to that? Only that, that <laughs> I've experienced all of that. So that's, I'm talking firsthand. I mean, I had a sex test done in 1976 when I went to my first Olympics. And to say that is intrusive is ridiculous because it was literally a swab on the inside of my mouth, which took two seconds. And so end of story, it was, you know, the easiest thing in the world. And you only need to have one in your whole life. And they're cheaper than having a drug test. So the number of drug tests that an international athlete has throughout their career is astronomical versus one test on the inside of your mouth. So I don't think that you could put cost as a reason why we wouldn't go back to simply saying, let's find out if someone carries a Y chromosome and have a female sex protected category and then an open cl in a classification where everyone is, is invited to be able to compete. And it's about 
making that open classification inclusive welcoming, and, uh, yeah. welcoming and, and everything so that we can have equality for the binary sex that we have you know and the Casa Semenya case is complicated but DSD athletes, particularly in Rio, were massively overrepresented in the, in the 800. They took the first, the second, and the third, and all of them were 46XY, you know? And, and so again, if you're carrying a Y chromosome, which has a reaction of, of testosterone, you really shouldn't be there, you know, because basically your biology is male. So you should be in a male category. Um, and it's a shame that in 92, we stopped using the sex test. That's my feeling is that we stopped it. And I think it would be a very, good thing to bring back but. No. yeah it's, no. it's hillary said disagree. in the chat well said sharon <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> yep historically those were the reasons supplied but yeah i think sharon's kind of right on the money with a lot of that yeah all right well we since sharon started talking you should just go ahead and introduce yourself sharon and then yeah. uh, tell us your yeah. background yeah, so Thanks. my background is for Chris, me. Thank you. Thank really you for your time, time Dr. Chris. Thank you so much. If you yep. if you awesome. thank you. Um, yeah, my background is swimming. So I was really interested in what Chris was saying, obviously, about swimming then as well in the States. Um, I've been to 11 Olympic Games so far. Tokyo will be number 12. I've competed in three in three different decades. And my first was in 76, and my last was in 92. And since then, I've been on the side of the ball for the BBC. So I've been involved in international swimming for over 40 years. Um, yeah, predominantly on the presenting side or in actually in the pool and also a number of different panels at different times for different problems that, you know, that we've had. Um, but ultimately, the, the biggest reason why I'm so vocal about this, and a lot of people are not because they're very scared to be vocal, but the biggest reason I'm vocal is that for 20 years I competed against these Germans. So I had to deal with that unfair environment for a very, very long time um, where People on the side of the pool, in fact, throughout the whole world, knew exactly what was going on and nobody spoke about it. And it was totally ignored. So, for example, in my Olympic Games in 81, I won my silver medal. Um, something like 96% of the medals in the women's swimming events were won by East Germans, gold, silver and bronzes. And they won one medal in the men's and nobody still did anything about it. So, it, I mean, it was just ridiculous. But nobody talked about it and nobody spoke up for the athletes that were being beaten. And those, those things have never been corrected, even after all these years, even if we know categorically what was done, how much was taken, when it was taken, it's still not been fixed. And I just don't want a generation of young women to end up with the same problem, because I do believe that ultimately this will be fixed. But I believe that, you know, potentially there'll be young girls that will lose medals that they shouldn't to prove a point that is is that males are biologically stronger than females, which we already know. That's what I find so very frustrating. I think we all do. Yeah. Um, great to have you, Sharon. And we will hear more from you later on in some Q&A. We'll do a quick intro from Inga. And then I want to hear from Colin. <laughs> Inga, introduce I mean, yourself. I mean, your other token Olympian here. I've been in three Olympics. <laughs> 12 world championships and multiple medals at worlds and um, similar to what uh, Sharon went through is that you know our big scandal was EPO and EPO dominated everything and you know cheating's cheating and we've all kind of run into this and we're trying to get this um, the all competition and since we're here for the Olympics the Olympic competitions to be to be as clean as that we can get them because nobody wants to go in there at that level and I've dedicated you know 20 years of my life to training to lose that first spot podium to to EPO and, and to drugs and hold so, up Inga can you explain what EPO is to our guests please um, erythro now I can't pronounce it as I'm talking but it's it's it gives you more red blood red blood cells and which is and when you get into endurance athletes or athletics, you know, your performance rate, I think, goes up like 15%. And so when you're in a sport and you and you you spent 20 years of your life doing this, and you're trying to get a 1% gain or a 2% gain, and the next thing you know, you get 10 to 15%, you can't even compete with that. And so trying to get this, uh, the playing field level, and now we have biological males coming in. Well, no woman wants to spend her whole life dedicated to this, to go in there. And, and if I knew that I had to compete against drugs, and I'd be constantly losing to drugs. It just takes away all of that desire to want to be there. And it, it's the repression from the women 
at the very get go, knowing that it's not going to be fair. And so if I had had to be competing against the men for those spots, it, it, it takes away that desire. And it's, it's really going to hurt the young girls coming up. So like right now, like let's look at fairness. When you want to get into sports, you have age categories, you have weight categories, you have, so like even in the age category from six all the way up to 80 years old, you choose the category that you're in, or you choose like with lifting others, you know, you choose the weight category that you're in. I mean, thankfully we have wonderful things like say Special Olympics, there's a category. We have Paralympics and we have, and we have the Olympics. And so you find that category that you fit into based on physiology, weight, things like that, but not a single category is, is determined by how you feel. And this is what's happening with the XY um, athletes coming in is, is based on a feeling. And you don't see any of these other categories based on feel, is based on physiology and biology. And we need to, th this is, fighting for the women doesn't mean that you're transphobic. They don't, they, they don't even add up as a disingenuous argument. Speaking up for women, this is what we're doing here so that, you know, so that women like me and Sharon don't have to always get second place to a system that's not fair. That's this great. is why I'm here. <laughs> I can't wait to talk with you more, but I, I'm chomping at the bit to hear from Colin. I am so grateful for guys like him to step up. He is an evolutionary biologist and I'm going to let him introduce himself and roll white with it. Thank you, Colin. Awesome. Can you guys hear me? Just making sure I'm unmuted here. Yeah. Yep. Okay, awesome. So, uh, yeah, I really liked <laughs> Dr. Hunt's overview and hearing from uh, Sharon and Inga. So, uh, I'm not an Olympian like Sharon and Inga or a powerlifter like Chris. Uh, I do do some amateur bodybuilding, which is, I guess, sort of a sport. <laughs> so, what I am, though, is uh, an evolutionary biologist. Well, I mean, you can maybe say an ex-evolutionary biologist now, since I was sort of exiled as a heretic from academia, given my unwillingness to toe the line regarding sort of the sex denialism and gender ideology that we're up against that's denying uh, the existence of males and females. Um, but unlike a lot of the speakers here, I didn't really start by taking an interest about trans women competing in women's sports per se. That sort of came about later for me. I came mainly uh, to the issues of males competing in sports by first obser observing uh, so academic scientist friends of mine that were making these outrageous claims on social media, like things like there were five sexes or that sex was a spectrum or, uh, you know, a social construct. Um, and as a biologist, this just seemed absolutely outrageous. And it was clear to me that these claims were being sort of more propelled by progressive politics than a commitment to actual facts and the science behind it. Uh, so I, I wrote an essay on the topic and it was specifically and explicitly addressing the factual errors and like the pseudoscience surrounding the claims um, of, you know, five sexes, sex as a spectrum and stuff like that. It wasn't until a little bit later that I really started taking interest in the consequences of the belief that sex is a spectrum or a social construct, um, you know, especially how they overlap with uh, or how they overly, overtly trespass on women's rights and sports and the gay community and, you know, both the mental and physical health of children who are sadly being sort of swept up in this whole thing too. So you don't really get away with denying such a huge aspect about fundamentally about reality without having certain negative consequences appear elsewhere. <laughs> so uh, I guess a lot of my work in this area is focused on debunking pseudoscientific notions such as the sex spectrum which is essentially the claim that we can't really talk about males and females per se, but must instead speak of, of sort of these miasmic notions of maleness and femaleness. You know, in other words, males and females aren't discrete categories we can speak of, uh, like heads or tails on a coin, but exist sort of on a continuum and that any line we attempt to draw to separate these two classes uh, um, of individuals is, is purely sort of arbitrary uh, and inherently oppressive. So speaking out on these ideas from inside academia, which I was doing up until about, uh, you know, a few months ago, I think in April, um, students and faculty came out and, you know, denounced me claiming my views were transphobic, or they said that uh, uh, my ideas were an attack on trans and non-binary identities. Students informed my department diversity committees that they felt unsafe with me on campus. 
you know, like some, like a nerdy biologist who studies bugs is going to leave my lab and go around campus punching trans people or something. So after enduring a lot of those, that sort of ostracism, I eventually left and decided to pursue journalism, I guess, talking a lot about more on this subject and science generally and whatever sort of happens to cross my mind. So that's largely where I'm coming from. Uh, I can leave discussion about like the univariate fallacy later if you want in Q&A or you can talk about it now or whatever you guys prefer. Go ahead. Okay. Be great. <laughs> so um, there's a sort of way of thinking uh, or perhaps it's kind of more of a rhetorical tactic than anything that uh, that's used by many of the sort of trans and gender activists on this subject to try to debunk the notion that we can classify individuals as as being male or female instead of you know ideas of maleness or femaleness um, and it's also used to downplay sort of sex differences and athletic abilities too so with regard to sex itself you'll often hear activists insist that you know one sex is determined by by many traits such as like hormone levels or chromosomes even sometimes voice pitch and facial hair genitals gonads etc so uh, they're trying to convey is that sex is what's called a like a, a polythetic trait or that one sex can't be reduced to a, a single thing but it's rather sort of a composite trait or composed of a of a constellation of traits um, uh, essentially but this this concept of biological sex that it's a composite trait is is completely wrong and it sort of follows from a fundamental misunderstanding about what the nature of biological sex actually is which is at base connected to the distinct types of sex cells that an organism produces. So as a broad concept, males are the sex that produce uh, small sex cells or sperm and females produce large sex cells, so ova or eggs. Um, because there's no intermediate sex cells, uh, that's why there's really no sex spectrum and it's not a composite trait. But then there's an important caveat to make here that this is sort of talking about sex as a broad category, but if we're going to talk about the sex of individuals, um, it isn't based, um, sorry, the, the sex of individuals isn't based purely on whether individual can actually produce certain gametes at any given moment. Um, so like prepubertal males don't produce sperm and some infertile adults of both sexes don't produce um, any sex cells for various reasons. But it would be incorrect to say that these individuals don't have a discernible sex um, because when we're talking about flesh and blood individuals, an individual's sex corresponds to sort of one of two distinct types of, uh, of evolved reproductive anatomy. So ovaries or testes that develop to produce uh, sperm or ova, you know, regardless of their, their past, present, uh, or, or future functionality. Activists sort of ignore this distinction uh, between primary and secondary sex characteristics. Um, and so I often use the analogy of, of bikers and cyclists to sort of clarify this distinction and, and highlight what the univariate fallacy is. Um, which, and basically, if I could give sort of a quick definition of the univariate fallacy, it's the insistence that, uh, that because you can't narrow down the, uh, the definition of two different groups to a single variable, therefore that these, these, these categories don't really exist. And what a lot of these activists do, they're inverting it. They're, they're trying to say that biological sex is a composite trait when in reality it's not a composite trait. So uh, let me kind of talk about bikers and, uh, and cyclists sort of to, to, to kind of highlight this. So bikers ride motorcycles and cyclists ride bicycles. So these vehicles, they're pretty similar. They have, you know, two wheels, handlebars and seats and spokes, uh, but they also differ in one very fundamental way. So motorcycles are powered by engines and fuel, whereas bicycles are powered by, you know, your pedaling legs. Whether someone is a biker or a cyclist depends in entirely on the binary criterion of whether they're riding a motorcycle or a bicycle. So this is the primary characteristic that defines a biker or a cyclist. But there's also many secondary characteristics associated with bikers or cyclists. So uh, bikers, for instance, are more likely to wear, you know, leather jackets, have tattoos, and wear cut, cut jeans and things like that. Uh, maybe wear bandanas. Uh, cyclists are more likely to wear skin tight, skin tight spandex and have those aerodynamic helmets um, uh, that only cover the top of their head. But an important thing to note is that a person riding a motorcycle who happens to be wearing a spandex suit and a light 
lighter helmet doesn't become a cyclist or less of a biker because they share these secondary traits that are more commonly associated with cyclists. And conversely, you know, a, a person riding a bicycle wearing jeans has skull tattoos and a leather jacket doesn't become a biker or less of a cyclist because they share these secondary traits more typical of bikers. So just as these sort of secondary traits don't define bikers and cyclists, secondary sex characteristics such as uh, you know, development of breasts, body shape, voice pitch, whether or not you have facial hair, uh, upper body versus lower body strength, uh, these traits don't define what a male and female is. Males and females fundamentally are going to be sort of going back to what type of uh, reproductive anatomy you have, which is analogous to, you know, the type of vehicle, a bike, or a motorcycle that, that you might be, uh, be riding. And so another quick aside is that the univariate fallacy is also used to sort of talk about differences in um, not just male and female differences biologically, but also differences in uh, sporting ability. So this univariate game gets played with many of the activists when they try to argue that differences in male and female ability uh, aren't comparable by pointing to individual trait after individual trait, and then when they inevitably find some, uh, you know, any degree of overlap on these individual traits, they'll assert, you know, like, see females can be uh, that way too, and if you don't think, you know, um, and, and we don't think those individuals should be banned from sports. Um, so we spend a lot of time and energy sort of making these individual arguments for individual traits, uh, and Dr. Hunt brought this up in his opening uh, mini lecture too. Um, so while it's not really useless to be talking about individual traits like height and how strong individuals are, um, it does sort of miss a larger and I think more fundamental point. So the, the effects of testosterone don't really work on single traits in isolation. You know, they apply to entire bodies. And what competes in a sporting event you know, um, except for maybe highly specific sports like powerlifting that only focus on one trait like strength. Um, so what competes in sporting events aren't just individual traits, but really are a constellation of traits that make up entire bodies. So all the differences that we can name between males and females in ability, uh, these actually add up to make male athletes much more athletically superior than you would conclude by looking at any single trait in isolation. So when you consider all of the traits in aggregate, the performance differences between males and females is really just unbridgeable. And I think that's something we maybe need to focus on a little bit more too, rather than looking at this individual by individual trait. And then, you know, activists trying to dunk on this by like showing that like, oh, there's, you know, 30% overlap in strength or something like that. Uh, when it's considered all together, the differences are really profound. So that's sort of what the univariate fallacy, how it's used and, uh, you know, keep, a, keep an eye out for it. Um, so you know how to combat it, basically. It looks like we are going to be joined by a special surprise. Emma Hilton, thank you for hopping on here, yeah. dear. You're on mute. Unmute you. And then, um, Emma, can you introduce yourself quick? There we can go. I? Yep. You're on. Can you hear me or am I? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I don't mean to interrupt Colin. Carry on. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that was it. I, I finished. <laughs> he was just but, finishing you know, up. Perfect timing. I was just really hoping Emma would show up because Emma, maybe you can give us a quick history of the IOC rules as pertaining to, first of all, transsexuals and then transgender very quickly. So, because we really didn't go over them. Sorry, Linda, I had you on mute just a moment. Are you talking to me asking for just this? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, the just, you know what? Because we, we, talk, we call this the Olympics discussion, but we really, for the sake of the audience, have not undertaken yet the, the um, stage by stage uh, rules changes that happened throughout, you know, since the 96 and then 2003 and then 2015. Um, and you have a really great lecture on that. If anybody wants to uh, go to Emma Hilton at Fond, Fond of Beatles uh, on Twitter, she has, do you still have that pinned? Um, I do, it's somewhere in the, the um, my pinned post, yeah. Yeah, but anyway, maybe just, if you don't mind, I know- uh, No, of course I don't, I'm just trying, I'm just trying to find, then, I've got like obviously written timelines and that kind of thing. Um, we so, kind of sprung this on Emma here. <laughs> sorry. 
<laughs> no, it's okay. Um, so the history of the IOC rules um, started, well, Chris went through the kind of history of sex testing and Sharon um, and Inga have kind of uh, added to this, you know, the kind of process of trying to understand, um, particularly in the light of um, Eastern Bloc doping and that kind of thing, um, whether there were, essentially whether there were cheating um, males competing in female sports, um, in the purer sense of cheating males who were kind of state, you know, sponsored, and also then extending out into females who were, you know, against their will and really heavily doped and, you know, an entirely terrible kind of time in, in sport. Um, so all these kinds of tests to try and understand who was competing in which sex category and whether it was appropriate that they were, uh, were really centred around some quite ugly things um, that we, uh, you know, it's difficult to get around, genital inspections, that kind of thing, karyotyping. Um, and, and so that was all abandoned, I think after 96, Linda may remember or others may remember more, um, after the Atlanta Games, was it Atlanta 96? Yes, it was Atlanta, yep. So where they discovered that out of, I, I mean, I forget the, the numbers, but there was something, some really hugely disproportionate number of XY people in, in the female category. And this came yep. a bit of a shock, um, perhaps even to, you know, some of the, the women who were competing in those categories. Um, and, and it was kind of decided that sex testing would go by the by. You know, that it was invasive and, and people's medical information wasn't for public consumption and that kind of thing. Um, so, so that kind of was just, you know, there was just no sex testing. And then we, we reached the kind of the idea that there are, there are intersex women who are hyper, hyper androgenic, um, who are crashing out of testosterone, you know, threshold tip. Um, and that we need to introduce testosterone tests to, to understand, um, females and how they might compete in the female category. And in 2004, and my understanding is this wasn't particularly well um, well designed as a meeting. Someone kind of said, and I don't know who it was, someone kind of said, would this apply to males too? So basically the idea was thrown out there. It came, it came out of a, a Spanish case um, of the Spanish uh, National Committee saying, we've got a, a trans woman would these rules kind of apply, you know, these high testosterone, do we think we can lower them? Would that, you know, meet the criteria for competition as a female? And they had, you know, you can imagine these people, they're having a meeting over dinner and just kind of going, oh, that'll be all right. And what they decided basically was if a male had had surgery to remove their testes, so they're not producing any um, gonadal um, testosterone, so if they'd had surgery, if they were, you know, legally female, so they were recognised within their home country with the legal status of female, um, that, that it was probably all right for them to compete in the female category. And I think it was done on a very ad hoc basis with lots of people who were DSD specialists, uh, lots of medics who were uh, clinical kind of clinical care people, but not really anyone saying, um, well, have we got any kind of evidential basis for this? Um, they called in a, a kind of, or they relied heavily on a paper that was published the year after that showed um, trans women unexpected, or sorry, not unexpectedly, when they suppress testosterone, they lose muscle. This is not a surprise. Um, and they said, look, they lose muscle, they, you know, they've gone the distance, they've done everything we expect um, of a male who wishes to be living as a female. Uh, it, we think it's all right. And then in 20, you know, this went on for ages then, and in 2015, they, they went back to their rules and just kind of threw out almost everything and said, a male has to lower their testosterone for 12 months. Um, and then they just have to, for sporting purposes, not even legally in their, you know, their own kind of jurisdiction or legal system, just within their sport, had to say, and I'm a female. And they have to maintain that declaration for something like four years. With um, no surgery, no surgery. And, and so anything. now no surgery, just, just taking um, a testosterone suppressor for 12 months before it has to reach a certain level. Uh, the threshold is very generous 
compared to normal female levels. Um, and again, with very little uh, kind of um, reference to the science that was available at this point now. So we'd gone from two, the 2004 meeting where they said, might be all right, um, with one paper that they kind of uh, worked from, um, to 2015, where there was, I think, six or seven at this point, actually measuring strength differences and saying, look, it's not that, I mean, you know, the papers that they, they could have looked at weren't specifically measuring in a sporting context, but they were measuring strength. They were measuring things like grip strength and, you know, um, uh, leg presses and that kind of thing. And measuring small changes, 5%, less than, less than 5% in some cases. And the ISC didn't even <laughs> reference any of these. They didn't think, hang on, is anyone published, you know, some data about how um, strength or muscle mass changes in, in trans women when they do the, you know, when they follow these rules that we're about to institute and say it's fair, um, do they do that? And, and it's become increasingly clear since 2015 that, that the strength and muscle mass loss is, is really very, very, very I mean, surprisingly modest, if I'm honest. I thought it would be bigger, mm. um, but it is not. And the data is really coherent across, across many kind of longitudinal studies, so studies that go from kind of before and after this um, 12 months of of testosterone suppression so so it seems to me across this like what where are we now like 15 or so years a very ad hoc firefighting kind of you know approach without anything particularly rational mm -hmm. and increasingly over the last few years it being very clear that this is ideological rather than i mean i've never seen in any of their minutes what about female athletes here i don't yeah, think they happened ever thought or or at least never referenced and um, anyone saying hang on a minute what do have we asked female athletes do we you know aside from ideas of fairness have we asked them what they want from their sport and so so it seems to me it's been a absolutely nonsensical process so they thank, thank you emma thank you so much i want to hear a little bit more about sharon's experience in the olympics and how they didn't stand up for women then. No, no, for a very long time. You know, for basically, it would have been the 72, 72 Olympics were probably the last Olympics that the East Germans didn't make much of an impact on. So 76, Montreal Olympics, uh, 80 Olympics, obviously not 84 because they weren't there. So you'll see a very big difference in the sort of people that were winning to the people that were winning four years previous or winning the world championships that year. And then 88 would have been the last before the war came down in 89. So it covered a... a quite a long period of time. They had no East German doctors um, that were ever under suspicion. They had East German doctors sitting on the international doping panel. So every time they came up with a new way to test, they would just go back and work out how they could avoid it. There was no out of season testing. There was no out of country testing. So in other words, they would only test immediately after the major championships. Um, there was no passports, you know, there was sort of no history of anything. And we would often have East German athletes who would arrive at a major championships, world championships, Europeans, Olympics, and we'd never seen them before and they would break a world record, you know, and if that's just not what happens in sport, people have to have a progression from being a good youth all the way up through a learning process. And, and it, I mean, it was just crazy. And I felt very sorry for these athletes because obviously a lot of it was uh, not in their control. I don't go along with the, the story that they totally were oblivious. I think they were aware to a degree what was going on because they're not blind. You know, they could see the differences that it was making to their body. They could see the success that they were having in women's events. It would have changed their, their voices, their five o'clock shadows. You know, they would have become very masculine with their, their physical um, just, just appearance. Um, and... <sighs> They were often removed from their parents and they were put on these little blue pills and many years later i did a documentary for channel four i think it was and we actually found out that the ioc had had several people that had actually um left east germany you know snuck out of east germany gone to the ioc with these little blue pills and they had totally and utterly ignored it they had paid no attention whatsoever so they let two groups of people down you know they let the clean athletes down because they weren't policing the sport properly and they let these young girls down who have since been made very, very poorly with what they were given, which was very old fashioned, basic 
you know, forms of testosterone and, and, and steroids and steranobol and all sorts of things, which had awful side effects. And in fact, we've had quite a few swimmers die, you know, so it's and sterility issues and all sorts of things. So, yeah, it was horrendous. And they documented all of this. So when I went to the Stasi to do this TV show, it was all in paper. It was all in black and white. What they took, when they took, how they took it, what testing they did. And they worked out that they could make a 9% improvement on average by giving testosterone through to young girls through puberty. Now, 9% in my particular race would have put the girl 16 seconds behind me that beat me. And she wouldn't have even qualified for the Olympic Games. Wow. So when you're talking about tiny percentages wins gold medals, if you're just giving away 9%, I mean, that's, you know, why I mentioned how many East Germans won gold medals in, in 1980, you know, gold, silver and bronze medals, you know, in, in individual events. It was just ridiculous. I think there was two other countries, maybe three, Russia being one of those. Russia, Australia and Britain, myself, in the individual women's events in the swimming pool, nobody else won any medals whatsoever. It was, I mean, just absolutely crazy. The dominance was extraordinary for them not to question what was going on. Yeah. So 9%, you know, 9%, they dominated with 9%. And in, a, in an Olympic sport, so you have to compare apples and apples. You cannot compare apples and pears. We cannot turn around and compare a not a very good male athlete with an elite female athlete. You have to compare elite male with elite female. So in Olympic sport, the difference between elite athletes is 10 to 30%, give or take a percentage. So that's already more than the East Germans had. And they totally and utterly dominated. It's, it's, it's just ridiculous. I mean, we don't stand in earthlies, you know, in, in, in events, and because no matter how hard you train, no matter how talented you are, you cannot give away 10%. Yeah. And it, it is just a shame that other athletes are not in situations where they can speak up. We're so grateful for people like you, Sharon, that yeah. have had experiences like this, that know what it means for future generations of females. Yeah, and you know, and in my experience, I haven't spoken to a single competing athlete yet who doesn't agree. The problem is, they are just very frightened to speak up, and they're under instructions from sponsors, from their sporting bodies, from Olympic bodies, that they're not allowed to speak up. So it's it's a real shame. I mean, um, in one weekend, and Emma will know all this because you know Emma's been on board with a lot of stuff we've been doing for a very long time. But in one weekend, uh, eighteen months ago, uh, myself, Paula Radcliffe and Kelly Holmes got together 65 Olympic medalists and world champions to sign a letter which went to the IOC in literally the space of a couple of hours. But every single one of those, apart from the three of us, did not want their names mentioned. And these were all Olympic medalists. You know, very big names that every single one of you would know. Yeah, that was the same yeah. thing I ran into is I got 30 Olympians that would sign you know, a letter that I sent to the IOC, but it, same thing, everybody wanted their name to be kept anonymous so that they didn't have to run into the vitriol, lose jobs, um, yeah. not have to have the harassment. And I know that what you've gone through, Sharon, and what I've gone through in this effort of speaking out, we're being silenced and protecting women should not equal being a bigot or a transphobe, just protecting women should be protecting women. And we have fought really hard to, you know, I don't know about swimming, but when I first started racing my bike, I was the only woman standing on the starting line. And over all of these years, we develop a sport and it, it takes a long time to develop this. And now we're getting, I feel like we're going backwards is, you know, what's going to happen to, our, you know, to women and sports. It, all of this progress is, you know, soon there will be no more women on the podiums. I just and had a it's conversation. Not just podiums, is it? It's kind of scholarships too, and sponsorship and deals and commercial contracts and everything. You know, everything that goes with with being successful in sport from the very bottom all the way to the very top. Oh, all of the young girls, you know, when I started off in first and cross country, had we not had Title IX, you know, here in the States to encourage these young girls to compete, you know, did they go on to be Olympians like me? Um, yes, some of them did, and they never would have gotten that start had it not been for Title IX for them at a very young age to be able to develop, to become Olympians. And a lot of those girls that didn't go on to scholarships and things like that, what I've kept in contact with all of them, but the, the self-esteem that was developed by being able to, to participate in sports was, was instrumental. And I still remember the one girl that, you know, she was a straggler on the team, um, well, actually, that was me. Um, when I first started <laughs> freshman year, I was the, the, the scrawny, gangly, 
but it, it allowed me to develop and it allowed me to get my confidence. And then within a couple of years, I'm winning everything. And then I get to go on to be an Olympian. And the other scraggly girl, we still talk about the, the confidence that it gave her to develop. And so in this conversation, we keep talking about these, these young boys with, you know, who are having questions with gender dysphoria. My heart goes out to them. Mm. They oh, definitely okay. need a support group. But, but we're forgetting the conversation about those young scraggly girls um, and the support that we needed coming from broken families, from difficult backgrounds. We too need the support. And this is why women's sports were started was for the young scraggly girls as well. And, the, and these boys that are having gender dysphoria, they need support. And, and there's a support system set out there for them. And, and, and I really want to encourage that, but their feelings and emotions as valid as they are for a young boy, it doesn't belong in women's sports. Those women's sports are there for the young girls. And we have to keep remembering that we have fought really hard for the women. And we want to continue to fight with the women and we don't want to be labeled that we're transphobics or bigots because we are those young women that we were able to grow and develop. Like I look at, you know, you, Sharon, and had you not had swimming, you wouldn't have been in the Olympics. And where would you be now as a woman? And, 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 and I'm not ask, asking you to answer that, but it's like these are opportunities that we too get to have as you see those men graced across the boards for their Olympic prowess, we get to have those opportunities as well. And this is what we're fighting for. And we're still growing and, and gaining those opportunities as well. I spoke with the current Olympian this week who was informing me how this year's Olympics or this coming Olympics would have been the first time for a female BMX bike riding event but there are only three spots and one of those spots is going to a biological male. So the first year we have this female sport in the Olympics and a male could be on the podium. Yeah, he, he has that opportunity in the men's category. There's a category set aside for the biological males. And so they do not... have a history of racing as a male. They right. showed and up as a female one day. We're not taking the ability for them to race away from them. We're just saying there's, there's, a, there's a category. There's a place for it. And right. it's not in women's sports. Right. So what happens now? So what happens when you speak out? Because, you know, I think based on Sharon and Inga, both of you have had experiences. When you speak out, um, it probably validates some of the hesitancy based on your experience, why, what happens, uh, maybe Sharon, you can tell us what happened to you when you speak out. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the vitriol that goes on, on on social media is just extraordinary. The thing I'm just the most disappointed in is just the general media who do not even report factual things. You know, you talked about Casta Semenya earlier. We only had one newspaper in the whole of the UK that put down that Casta was 46XY. Now the case, the CAS case only actually applies to someone that's 46XY. So they are absolutely not going to be sued if they put the facts into the newspaper. But most of them left it out. And their yeah. lines were, you know. One more time for those in the back. Castor <laughs> has XY chromosomes, which yeah, lead I mean, to the increased testosterone level. The line that they use is, is unusual levels of testosterone for a woman. And you go, but no, she has normal levels of testosterone for a male and that's what's being left out the whole time and it's just so very frustrating and even people in athletics aren't sometimes aware that Casta has 46 XY you know and again when we talked to Chris earlier I don't know whether he, he was aware but there's massive confusion in, even inside between DSD and trans athletes because DSD athletes in just three events are reduced to five nanomoles trans athletes at the moment are 10 nanomoles so there's just no, there's no sense across anything. It's just ridiculous. Well, to give people context, you know, as a biological woman, we were allowed up to have two nanomoles per liter, but the transgender woman or the transgender identifying male can come into women's sports and have 10 nanomoles. Yeah. So here's it, the crazy thing. If I wanted to take up sport tomorrow and go back to swimming, 
And I put 10 nanomoles of testosterone into my blood because I'm thinking, do you know what? They're allowed 10. I would receive a four-year ban. You get a four-year ban, but they can raise to 10. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where, where's the fairness in that? Um, where is the just basic common sense and fairness in this? It's just extraordinary where we're at. I just, and the well, lack of debate and, and inclusion, like you mentioned, Dinger, just talking to you know, women sports people, we were never consulted. We were never asked. We were, and date, scientific data was never used. I feel very strongly if transgender women want a place in women's sport, it should have fallen to them to prove how they could make it fair, not the other way around. Well, and here, here's another angle that I've taken at it, you know, the, this, this, this right to compete. Absolutely. What, one of the disagreements I have with having the transgender women or the trans identifying male in women's sports is in order to be there, they have to take drugs in order to drop their testosterone levels. What kind of society are we that we're forcing them to take drugs in order to compete? Now, they don't, they don't have to. But right now, the IOC is like, yeah, if you want to compete with the women, here's all the different drugs that you have to take. And studies show that when they take these, this is lifelong damage that they're going to have by taking drugs. And yet our, our, our International Olympic Committee is saying, we're going to force these drugs on you in order to compete. And this is, I just hate seeing this because a lot of people will take drugs in order to compete. You get it down to 10 nanomoles, it still is highly unfair. And they have a compromised body for the rest of their lives because they show as an XY, and Colin, you can help me with this, that when you take away the testosterone, the body effects that you have, you're, you're XY, you, there, you have that testosterone in there for a reason. And so yes, you do become more feminine. Maybe we could go on and on and on with this. I just one. want to butt in real quick that, um, to clarify, one of the drugs they take is bironolactone is actually a testosterone masking agent. It can mask testosterone levels in their testing. So it's just a circle about. And the other thing that we've not even touched on is we're supposed to obviously have a recorded reduced testosterone level for one year, but we have no system in place, and, and I'm sure Emma will come up, come up with this, but we have no system in place at the moment to police that. They can go to the place of their choice at the time of their choice. Very, very easily manipulated test. So they can have very high levels of testosterone when they're training and zip it down for when they need to be tested. Yeah. You, can, um, you can reduce uh, regular kind of male typical levels of testosterone to castration levels of testosterone within about 12 hours. Um, wow. So I, yeah. I mean, it's got a really short half-life. You pee it out very, very quickly. Um, and and so, so essentially, unless you're testing regularly, there, is, there are compliance issues. Now, we know that there are, uh, you know, testing procedural issues, but, but it would be very straightforward. Um, and we know that coaches and doctors and stuff will, will be on board with whatever maximizes, you know, um, athletic capacity here and um, so so it's not even kind of on season and off season it you could alter it weekly or or perhaps even to a higher resolution than that i think a lot of the discussion too about just reducing testosterone levels just really misses the fundamental point that we're not really talking about current testosterone levels that's not what the debate should be focused on but rather the effect of years and years of testosterone that is major body sort of transform in irreversible ways. You know, t taking testosterone yeah. for a prolonged time is it's like a one-way street. You might have some of the effects less than a little bit, but it doesn't really change the changes that your body's going to go through, how your bones develop and all of this. And it's just really, it ignores <laughs> the, the fundamental issue that we all should be focusing on. And that's yeah. the effects of male, male puberty, testosterone, and changing your body permanently uh, over time that there's no going back from. But there's also things like, you know, bone density and, and blood uptake and larger hands, larger feet, taller, Q angle. Women have so many more knee injuries because of the shape of our, our, our you know, our hip to our knee ratio. And all and menstruation, which we have to deal with, you know, which interrupts training and interrupts racing. All of these things come with our biology, which does not come with male biology, you know? So like you say, testosterone is one, is one part of it, particularly testosterone through puberty, but that's not the whole story. So if you're carrying a Y chromosome, you have a Y advantage, you know, regardless of levels of testosterone. 
I think that kind of wraps up to what Colin was talking about earlier as well with this whole idea of of multi kind of variate, you know, kind of, uh, do we talk about strength? Do we talk about height? Do we talk about, you know, how wide your hands are or that kind of thing? And it's, there's just literally no kind of level of resolution that could be too low to describe the difference between males and females. This is a composite that, that is made up of so many different characteristics, all of which are going to interact in many different ways that aren't going to be simple additive kind of, if you've got long arms, you've got big hands, you're going to be better at basketball or, you know, whatever. It's, um, you, you simply can't separate down to the level of the differences between males and females. We are qualitatively, that means we are, we are objectively different types of body. And just to try and say, you know, here's a list of differences, let's try and measure each of those, I think is impossible. There's six and a half thousand different gene, you know, expressions between us. Who knows what any of those are doing to make, you know, to make males stronger and better because evolutionarily that's what they're meant to be. And the only simple way forward is a simple solution because, you know, there is no organisation in the world that's going to be able to come up with 6,000 ways we can try to reduce the difference. It's impossible. We know the single marker that makes people better at sport and it's that they're male. It doesn't matter what there is within them being male, it's that they're male. You line up the best 5,000 athletes at any single discipline and the first 3,000 will be male. That is the single thing that will divide for sports more fairly than any other age even age or as Chris said weight that kind of thing it's the single marker that says you're going to be better at sport than someone else so why is the IOC not listening <laughs> now there is a 64,000 question they didn't listen for 20 years with these Germans and I just think they don't know I honestly I don't know how we get them to listen unless we start going down the legal route which I think once there's a lot of testing going on at the moment, there's a lot of um, experiments going on in quite big universities around the world at the moment, and this data will come out. And I think the moment this data comes out, which is very sports related rather than just general, they will have that evidence and they will find it very hard then to turn around and say they're not aware that there is an actual proved scientific difference. So if you were a female athlete, then got beaten into second or third or no medal whatsoever, you could financially take the IOC to, 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 you know, to the cleaners. And I think that's where, unfortunately, we might end up having to go. They, or they might eventually get to a point where they realise that there's the potential for this and they'll do something about it. And it's so sad that it comes down to money because it should never be about money. Should, the IOC should be there to enforce fair, clean sports. But, well, well, think about WADA, the World Anti-Doping uh, Agency, right? Any drug that might give you an, an advantage might give you an advantage is declared illegal yeah i would think having a y chromosome what's that including yeah. testosterone which is on that yeah. list which is the thing which so is having a y chromosome in the men or in, in the women's category is more than a slight advantage mm. i mean so so try to put those two together a drug that will give you a 1% to 2% advantage is declared illegal, but being male right off the bat is going to give you a 10 to 30% advantage, yet they'll allow them in. The, the, the whole premise of to make this fair without doping just gets flown out, just blown out the door when you allow a male into female sports. I have a question here that I would really like to see answered by some of you. Um, it's popped up a couple of times here, actually. What about a male who has been on, quote, puberty blockers and hasn't so, had the, quote, testosterone advantage of puberty? So I, I'm happy to answer that uh, from a science perspective. Um, so there aren't, there aren't too many. St so first of all, I am going to say that I do have an ethical objection to puberty blockers, and I don't think we should be exploring this as a serious scientific hypothesis. Um, but there are a couple of papers that study um, males who have taken puberty blockers from about the age of 12. Um, and that's in line with international prescription guidelines. You're not allowed to prescribe puberty blockers before puberty starts, which kind of creates a bit of an odd argument because it means you can never undo puberty because it has to have started before you can start to try and undo it. 
Um, but, but a couple of studies, males from the age of 12 who've taken puberty blockers, who have at 16 gone on to um, estrogen therapy, and at 18 who have, some of, some of whom have elected to have their testicles removed. And so these um, males have been measured at about the age of 20, 18 to 22 kind of range. So they're, they're into, you know, they're starting to kind of gear up for being, you know, their peak strength and that kind of thing. Um, and they are, they're still taller. They're not as tall as, you know, their, their reference kind of cohort males who haven't had puberty block, but they're taller than reference females. And they're still stronger. Again, they're not as strong as, as their reference kind of cohort males. But they're still stronger than females so it seems even even when you block puberty as early as one might think is a possible way to identify that someone has started puberty um you you you're too late to start undoing it and i i really don't think anyone wants to think about what happens when we start these drugs in a nine-year-old yeah, emma i know that you've written before on the fact that a uh people with complete androgen and sensitivity syndrome, they're also overly represented in the, the top echelons of female sports. And essentially, if you have a, a male taking puberty blockers before the onset of puberty, they're essentially basically the same thing as someone with androgen and sensitivity. What's, what's the, uh, the, uh, the, I guess, the advantage that, you know, in these cases, just a Y chromosome has on the body? Can you talk about that at all? Yeah, so if you look at complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, so we're talking about um, people who are genetically XY, who have testes, who make testosterone, but they cannot respond to this testosterone at all. They're completely kind of non-functional as far as testosterone goes. So their phenotype is, is female in terms of their genitalia. Um, so, so they would represent a category of from a developmental biology point of view i you know i consider them to be male that doesn't mean i consider them to be kind of legally or socially male um but that would represent a category of male where i think it's probably broadly fair that they might be included in a female category that doesn't make it right i'm not suggesting that's what should happen what i'm saying is that in terms of athletic capacity that it might be broadly fair there's an argument against that um in the people with complete androgen sensitivity syndrome are taller than average so the female average in the UK is about 5'4 um, and, and women with uh, complete androgen sensitivity syndrome tend to be about 5'8 now that's a that's a fair difference in average but 5'8 is probably not crossing a kind of critical threshold for athletic ability but nonetheless it's a it's a foundational kind of difference in these biologies and that's always been the strongest evidence to me that the y chromosome in itself in the absence of a testosterone effect um, has some kind of positive effect now i know linda has talked with me before about you can detect differences in in boys and girls before puberty which is before you know this whole kind of testosterone huge like fireball <laughs> of you know development kicks in that and so maybe linda can talk about you know little boys are so yeah Go on. <laughs> yeah well I, I of course in track and field we actually have interestingly enough it's easy to look up online uh world records uh, for running jumping and throwing events starting even from age six and um so what happens is you have uh maybe even as much as um five, six, seven, even up to 10% difference between males and females at six and seven years of age um, in the running and jumping events, but way higher, like maybe 15 to 20% more in the upper body, for example, ball throw. And, and then what happens is, so you have this big distinct difference between little boys and little girls. And then as they get to about eight, nine, 10, uh, you see a little bit of a convergence of that difference, um, never though with upper body strength, but for jumping and throwing events, or sorry, jumping and running events, they get together. But what happens there is a lot of studies only start measuring children just prior to pu puberty. And what they're capturing there is if there's no difference between boys and girls at say, say 9, 10, 11, it's because the girls have advanced in maturation 
they've actually started to mature earlier than boys. So they have that momentary sort of advantage as girls because they went into the growth spurt a little bit earlier. So what you're seeing is, because we all know that girls um, have about a two year uh, head start on puberty compared to boys. So you would see, you know, and everybody knows this, like if you see children around grade five, four, five, and six, sometimes the little girls look really mature and the boys still look very childish. And so if you're just measuring the difference between boys and girls starting from that stage and then through puberty, it looks like there's no difference between boys and girls, but then the puberty happens. But if you actually start earlier, there's a big difference, then it gets smaller, then it gets bigger again. And that's only because of the change in maturate, uh, maturity rates. Um, but for sure, when you look at the upper body strength, and I mean, I coach, I've been coaching for, you know, 30 years and I, I can tell you, <laughs> you know, an eight-year-old boy can do many more chin-ups than an eight-year-old girl. And it's not just because, um, you know, the little girl never had an opportunity to wrestle with, you know, her brothers or something. Uh, upper body strength has a distinct difference. And I've actually witnessed, um, it's almost like when girls hang from a chin-up bar, it's almost like their shoulders almost get dislocated almost because they're almost so over flexible sometimes that they don't have there's something about the shoulder girdle and how you can get the leverage going. Um, and, and there's just something about the structure of a boy's upper body and the shoulders and the lats that enable him to actually have that kind of leverage. So even at that the early age, you can see these formations that are slightly different. Um, and of course there's studies, of, you can go back into physical anthropology, uh, studies between boys and girls and their morphology. But I can just say that from experience and from looking even just at the world record data, boys and girls, I mean, and it's very clear to me, there are differences that predate the puberty in terms of performance. So that would all suggest that, you know, blocking puberty is going to have a huge effect, but it, it yeah. still can't, um, you know, turn the clock back. To, to you know conception essentially now we're talking about whether you you know you've got an X or a Y sperm fertilizing the egg. Yeah I think it's it's all we all know that sex is immutable and and we stand in that truth and, and that's why we get attacked sometimes. Yes. We are going a little past our time. Go ahead, I Sharon. I find very fascinating. We're just, just throwing back to the sort of the little boys thing. You know, how outraged would everybody be if we had an under 12 competition and a 15 year old boy rocked up and went, oh, I identify as 12, I'm going to race in this race. Yeah. Nobody exactly. would stand for it. But that's what you're asking us to do. You know, yeah. it, it, yeah. well, there, that's, it's the simple, the simple way of just looking at it is that it's just, just an unfair advantage. And that comes with male biology the same the way that it comes with age you know when you're as young as you're in age categories well and the, categories. The, sim the, the simplicity of you should be able to move up a category so say you're a 12 year old and you want to compete with a 16 year old that's fine you can that's move fine, up a yeah. but you can't move down a category you can't be 16 and decide i want to be with the 12 year olds and like as women if there wasn't women to race with we moved up a category we raced with the men because that would be racing with children right but but you don't move down a category but you can move up a category so one of my arguments is like is that as a biological woman if i needed to i'll go race with the men so if you're a transgender woman you should be able to move up a category and go race with the men because well you're male and so it, it is you should be able to move up not not this move down a category I would say subject to as long as providing it's safe for you to do you know, right to, yeah. To, yeah. Oh, yeah, contact yeah. contact sports yeah. yeah yeah which is you know the, the ludicrousy really and obviously emma can speak about this hugely but this is the ludicrousy of the whole rugby situation yeah. you know i've got kids that have been involved in rugby i've got two boys and i had a girl and so grace in the middle was an athlete eventually but she played rugby with her brothers until she was 11. now at 11 they turned around and said you can no longer play rugby with the boys because it's dangerous. And we will yeah. not let you play rugby with the boys. So Children know the difference. They say that in one breath and then turn around and not acknowledge that in the next breath. I just don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, kids got it, the kids got it figured out. <laughs> yeah, the kids know. I guess the IOC needs to ask some kids. Well, well no, that, was, that, was, that 
that's all that's rugby rules that's not the case yeah. that's rugby well, rules okay, this yeah, country okay, say yeah. that you're not okay, allowed yeah. to play in boys right. teams once you get to 11 that's it's no longer you're no longer allowed it, if they can't put together a girls team you have to give up yeah they'll make an exception if you are an exceptional girl and it's subject to a physical assessment that you're not about you know that you that you're physically kind of matched but it will be under very careful and they don't like it they really really don't like it but yeah I mean, you're right broadly uh, you know 11 it's just uh, it's just uh, separated. contradictions you know mm -hmm. all the time and that's what's so very confusing yeah. Well, one thing we are doing is wrapping up our petition to the IOC. We have over 15,000 signatures, and I think all of us are on board. We'll be handing them that in at the end of the week here and hopefully get some attention. We have former Olympians from around the world, all levels, all ages. We have over 40 organizations that have supported us, and I'm really looking forward to see a response from them. So everyone can go to savewomensports.com slash two dash the dash Olympics and make sure that you get your name on there and sign it and share it this week. Um, I am so happy to have had this opportunity. I'm wondering if any of our panelists have any comments to round out that they didn't get out. Only that somebody mentioned about World Rugby being brave enough to do what they've done. And I know, I'm not sure if Colin was involved, but I know Emma was involved with obviously, you know, gathering an awful lot of information and giving it to, to World Rugby. And they have been, along with American Powerlifting, one of the brave associations to do something. And we are very, very, very grateful for them. Um, the other good thing is, is that I don't know whether, because you were based in America, you might not know, but us here in the UK have had a very good week. Um, we've, had, we, <laughs> oh, haven't we? we've had a very good week. We're smiling quite a lot this week because we've had our uh, education association have said they can no longer teach children that they're born in the wrong body in our schools, which is wonderful. And also, um, we can't self ID in this country either. So we can't just literally go, do you know what? I feel like a, a boy a girl today and I'm in your race. Like, we can't Fantastic. Do that. So, so we've I, had a, a good week in the UK, which is great. What, what I'm starting to see is a change where people, more and more people are getting brave enough to speak up. Yeah, we are getting traction. And you know what? We have to be very, very grateful to, to JK Rowling because, mm. you know, she's making a huge difference. Huge. That, that she's allowing us to be braver and to come forward. And she's taking so much flack. And I know, you know, Inga and I have taken a fair bit of flack and you guys have taken flack too. And it has been very difficult. And I've lost a lot of money and sponsors and and ambassador roles and all sorts of things and um you know you have to be able to live with your own conscience and that's the way that i look at it but i do think that jk rowling is making a math be different and today in the sunday times we've had a number of other amazing authors in this country i think a list of 65 70 odd well-known names come out and support her again so you know it, this pylon that we've been getting from um, activists on social media in particular is becoming less powerful and that's brilliant I think generally across the UK and the US, um, the 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 tolerance for for you know ideological sloganeering that is just founded in absolute kind of you know uh, nonsense, the kind of woke you know stuff. It just we're starting to question it, and we're starting to be supported in questioning it. And the more people that can, and it is hard to have your name out there. We all know this it's hard to have your name out there and you get hate emails and like Sharon says, you know, athletes, I don't blame them. I absolutely do not blame any athlete who, who knows what's coming and, and chooses to be quiet at this point in time. Um, but the more names that we do have out there, the, the easier it is for everyone and the easier it is to get more and more. And, and we are starting, it feels like we're reaching a bit of a critical kind of mass. Yeah. Hopefully. The floodgates yeah. opening, courage calls to courage. Yeah. And yes. we're now sitting at the popular table, so it's, it's okay <laughs> to speak in this table. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do hope important. all of those people, though, that, that you know, will be held to account. That's the thing that I get very yeah. frustrated about, is that the people that have made this so difficult mm. will probably just slither away. Yeah. And, and that is just extremely annoying. <laughs> yeah, it is. Colin, what were you saying then? Oh, I was going to say, I think the most important aspect, which what we're doing right now is basically normalizing this type of conversation because yeah. they've, it's gotten so bad because of people suppressing just even having the conversation. 
but what we're doing right now, everyone's speaking up, and especially, as you say, J.K. Rowling, providing so much shade for people, everybody here, just to sort of say, I'm not crazy. This is, <laughs> this is really what's going on, and being, you know, more brave to speak up and say something about it, because you have a lot more support. You're not just going to be standing up and then being the only one standing and getting shot anymore. There's, there's a, a support group, and that's what we need to do is make people feel that they have people that are on their side that'll speak up for them and, uh, and uh, applaud them for, you know, for, for doing what they think is right. That's right. And that's part of the reason why I started Save Women Sports is we're a platform to show people that it is okay to speak up and it is not hate speech to defend your rights, as Magdalene Burns said. And it's not bigotry to defend biology either. No, and I think the thing that's very frustrating as well is that none of us, we all love sport and we want sport to be inclusive. We don't want to exclude anybody. You know, I, 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 you know, I had bombs sent to me 25 years ago when I married a black man. You know, it's, I, I've had to deal with some of this crap before in my life and you get through it. But so I, so I'm, I pride myself on the fact that I, I believe wholeheartedly in equality for everybody and opportunities for everybody. But I do believe in fairness. And that's all for me. That's all that this has been about. It's just straightforward fairness. That's it. Exactly. We're not trying to ban anyone from sport. We're just trying to get everyone to play fairly. Emma, you're going to say something. What were you going to I say? Was, it was just a, just a, a back, back to Sharon, who I think is being modest, bringing up JK Rowling. And I think that we all recognize that athletes like Sharon, who has been there yeah. right from kind of the beginning, using a voice that, you know, the world does recognize rather than us kind of, you know, in the background. Yeah. But you were willing to go out there and say hard and strong, no, <laughs> we are not doing this. And Inga, and it's encouraging it's encouraging to see women, you know, really Truly. standing up. There. You know, Truly. this is not all JK Rowling. We're all part of this. Thank you. Yeah, so, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. You, <laughs> you know, we pay so much attention to, to all you wonderful scientists and what you say. So I've got the kind of practical thing where I've lived with for 40 years, the same as Linda. So we know absolutely first time mm -hmm. from our life experience. But at the same time, we do pay a lot of attention to the science and we try to make sure that we're very educated with the science so that we can answer the questions correctly and fairly, you know, and, and be open and honest about it all. Well, I think we've gone over the amount of time that I expected, um, but I think it's just been amazing to have all you um, wonderful people in one room. It, it's an honor for me and I look forward to giving more people opportunities. Uh, next week, we have another webinar about Title IX here in the US, but a final reminder, sign our petition to the Olympics. SaveWomenSports.com slash two dash the dash Olympics. Get your name on there, sign it, share the heck out of it this week. Um, we're gonna get it turned in at the end and we expect a response and we'll share that with you. Until then, um, Thank you all for joining. Thank you to our panelists, our attendees. It's been great to see you in the chat. I look forward to next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.